What is up guys? Welcome back to another awesome video. Today we are going to react to Europe Blaze, the 1848 Revolutions. I would get my Prussia helmet, but I don't want to waste the joke. I don't want to overuse it, so I'm just going to go in with my beautiful blonde hair. So without further ado, let's start this video. Thir 32 minutes. 1848. More than three decades after his defeat, the shadow of Napoleon Bo All right, as you can see by this map, France is still really not at their full extent. They take a little bit more right after Italy reunites, and, well, these two haven't reunited, so this looks like, yeah, the 1840s and 50s. This is also around the time that Karl Marx made his book and was starting to become really popular. Bonaparte and the French Revolution still looms over Europe. Oh, and by the way, the reason why this is called the Kingdom of Poland, and this is the Russian Empire, is because um, the Polish, and when they were kind of taking all the land, when all the land was taken up, they, they made a treaty where what would happen is they would get their much better atom, atomny, so, into and as long as they're integrated within the Russian Empire, so they gain a little bit more of their own kind of dominion, but at the same time they are kind of like they are integrated within the empire. So that was kind of the deal, kind of like Austria Hungary, but if you were to say Hungary was more like I don't know some territory in Bosnia getting the same kind of ability. Peace settlement of 1815 had been a triumph for reactionary forces. Europe's great powers, Britain, France, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, were committed. Wait, to <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It sounded like he just said Russia and Russia. Let me go back. This is a long video, so I gotta be. Uh, I don't want to make it too long. But also, look how cool it is. Russia and Russia were committed to. They did that on purpose. Prussia and Russia. Yeah, they were all the powers at the time. But the Austrians, I feel like they're starting to slowly collapse. They really start taking a bad turn within the 1860s. And France is still sort of growing. Like, they still have a long time before they hit their peak. To working together to ensure no more revolutions. Radicalism and republicanism would not be allowed to disturb the peace of Europe again. Yeah, yeah, the French Revolution. Napoleon rises. He's making a giant threat to all their power. So what they need to do is make sure that this doesn't happen anymore. Oh, I muted it. Metternich is regarded as the architect of this new conservative order. Some historians call it the Metternich system. And yet... Bro, you gotta be careful. You're gonna give some child a seizure. Also, like, man, I need, I need to learn. Is this, like, hand-drawn or computer animated? I want to learn how to make this type of map. Like, I want to learn how to draw much better so I can make stuff like this. Like, how cool would it be? Would you subscribe if I made a map and it was, like, animated? I mean, that would that'd be so cool to make animated maps. I'm going to try and draw more in the future. Across Europe, there are many for whom the ideals of the French Revolution remain not a nightmare, but an inspiration. Liberals seek personal freedoms and civil rights, such as equality before the law, protected by constitutions, a free press, and regular elections. Boo! We don't want freedom. <laughs> Nationalists share these aims with a desire in Italy and Germany for national unification, or in the multi-ethnic Austrian Empire for greater recognition, autonomy, and respect for language. Um, one criticism, which... Great effort. This looks amazing. The only thing is that it wasn't really as much Polish 
The Polish were a little bit more around here, but, you know, whatever. I guess there were some there, but they didn't really want that area as much. And then this entire area here was more like the, the Sudan land was more German. I don't know. I think it may, might have been different in geography in 1840 and like where they were. But based off what I do know, it kind of, the Polish were more around this area in the east, not really as much in the west. And uh, what else? Nah, I just, it is pretty accurate. Hungary, you know, Serbia, the Croatians, Romanians, yeah, it's all pretty accurate. They want to reunify and bring themselves all back together. And, yeah, Germany is probably one of the most desperate. They, like, spend all this time and effort and energy, but they just coll uh, kind of collapsed. The Holy Roman Empire just collapsed, so they're still trying to rebuild themselves up. Italy, you know what? Scratch what I said before. Italy probably would be the most desperate. It has been almost, like, a thousand years. No, it's been over a thousand years since Italy was one kind of kingdom, one kind of dominion together. Think about that. They, they're they all split apart into these little areas. It was known as Europe's playground. They probably would want to, like, really un you reunify. Like, they would really want that. Poles continue to seek the restoration of an independent Poland. There. Wait, if that's the Poles, then what, what, what is this flag? Okay. No, that's Polish. What? And whatever. Maybe they made some mistake, I don't know. But yeah, this is accurate. Galicia, Galicia or Galicia, whatever you want to call it. That area was heavily Polish, and there was a lot of Poles up north, and a little bit down in Poznan. And in a little area around here too, I think. And have launched one bloody uprising against the Russians in 1830. Their cause is supported by liberals across Europe. In most countries, liberals and nationalists face draconian censorship laws, arrest by the secret police, and bans on political parties and meetings. But there are always loopholes. In France, private banquets turn into political rallies. In Italy, scientific societies discuss politics, while gymnastic groups do the same in Germany. These liberal movements are dominated by the middle class, with their own local and national agendas, but also many shared values and aims. They are passionate, organized, and waiting for their opportunity. I believe that right now we are sleeping on a volcano. Can you not sense that the earth is trembling again in Europe? Can you not feel the wind of revolution in the air? Oh, like, oh, it was like Alex de Dover or whatever. Yeah, Alex de Dacqueville, French liberal politician, 29th January of 1848. Okay, I'm gonna, I have to kind of let this play out, like, it, <laughs> just don't wait, we're gonna make out my rate, my pacing. But it isn't just the middle classes that want change. By 1848, rising populations and food prices had created hunger, poverty, and social unrest across Europe. Low wages and hunger drive peasants to cities in increasing numbers where they become cheap labor to feed the growing pace of industrialization. They live in slums and work long hours in dreadful conditions, if they can find work. Violent protests by workers and peasants are on the rise. Harvest failures and potato blight make a bad situation worse, with a deadly famine in Ireland and food riots across France. In the face of such crises, Europe's governments offer little support or hope of reform. When French Prime Minister Francois Guizot is challenged that only the richest half percent could vote in France, he merely replies, Enrichissez-vous, get rich. In the winter of 1847-48, 
A sharp economic downturn throws thousands more out of work. The case for reform. Bro, how are you supposed to deal with that? Like, <laughs> idiots. Oh, you just get rich. I feel like that was the first type of guy that like Andrew Tate. Oh, you just get money. And then. Um, is more urgent than ever, but Europe's governments fail to act. The stage is set for a European revolution. This video is sponsored. I'm sorry, but no. No state in Europe is in worse condition than ours. In the country which is said to be the Garden of Europe, the people die of hunger and live worse than beasts. The only law is capitalist. Napoleon liberal. Oh, like Napoleon. That's a pretty clever. 1847. Luigi says Brini. Luigi sounds... I think that's more Italian, so... In southern Italy, the kingdom of the two Sicilies is ruled by Spanish Bourbon King Ferdinand II. His disastrous agrarian reforms have united Sicilian landowners and peasants against him. His kingdom will witness 1848's first revolution. In Sicily, furious crowds chase Bourbon troops out of Palermo, and the island declares independence, readopting its liberal constitution of 1812. Revolutionary fervor spreads to the mainland. Mass rallies in Naples force King Ferdinand to issue his own constitution. In Piedmont, Sardinia, the threat of revolution persuades King Carlo Alberto to grant a constitution, and there are celebrations in the streets of Turin. Across the border in Austrian-ruled Lombardy, Venetia, Italian nationalists revolt in Milan and Venice and drive out the Austrian garrisons. But as dramatic as these events are, they're about to be eclipsed by news from Paris. When France sneezes, Europe catches a cold. I mean, yeah, so what that expresses obviously is that France will do all kinds of things and then that will kind of really, really hurt Europe or like at least make some big change. Europe, since France is kind of they're in between, you know, countries like Britain, right next to Germany and Italy. They're kind of going to cause something. Germany also is kind of like that. But remember, they're not unified yet, so they can't really do as much. But I would say more central European countries would do more since they're in the middle of everything. But yeah, I get the whole point. At the time, France was very strong. Prince Clemens von Bitternich, Austrian Chancellor. No, of course, it's from an Austrian. Since France's 1830 July Revolution, the country has been oh, ruled by the, the so-called Citizen King. He's a more moderate figure than his Bourbon predecessor, Charles X, but he opposes further reform despite the growing economic crisis. His Prime Minister, Francois Guizot, is hated. When he bans the banquets that are really opposition rallies, angry crowds march through Paris, chanting, Down with Guizot! Long live reform! Guizot resigns, but it is not enough. No, 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 no. You gotta get a Bugatti! Wow! You just become rich. That's like the dumbest logic ever. You know what? I might be conservative, but I also feel like we got to have a lot of care for the people who cannot take care of themselves. I think that's, that's a very major thing. At least give them an ability to give, give a voice. Taking away their ability to give a voice is just like so terrible, bro. Nervous troops fire on the crowds. 52 civilians are killed. Louis Philippe loses control of the capital, and as the mob advances on the Tuileries Palace, he abdicates and flees to England. A 
new provisional government is formed. And from the Hôtel de Ville, new foreign minister Alphonse de Lamartine announces the Republic has been proclaimed. France's monarchy has fallen in just three days. Imagine if Napoleon never existed. We wouldn't have seen any of this. And the revolutions are some of the biggest stuff that ever happened because this stuff kind of started uh, Europe's humble into stuff like World War One over time. And it's also the reason the German Empire kind of formed together. They found a new threat and then they had nationalism and because of that they all unified together. So yeah, the French are the reason the Germans became powerful and the Germans are the reason the French became powerful. Because guess what? It made the British and the French closer together over time as the Germans became so strong. And it creates this kind of like uh, balance, tilt kind of thing, which I notice a lot that happens in Europe. You know, balance of power politics can be almost so literal sometimes. The news is carried across Europe by the new telegraph system. The effect is electrifying. Tell the people that I agreed to everything. Ferdinand I, Emperor of Austria. 75-year-old Austrian Chancellor Prince Metternich is among the first to be informed of the revolution in Paris. His police chief assures him there's no chance of such a thing happening in Vienna. But on the 13th of March, around 4,000 students, inspired by the news from Paris, march on the land. Well, it makes, makes sense it's college students. Now, like, but remember, back then, there was a reason to fight. Today, what reason do you have to really, um, you know, revolt if you're not living in, like, a third world country? You know, if you're living in somewhere like Europe or America, what's there to really fight for to, that is in the more, like freedom kind of uh, freedom liberal kind of side like i would understand a lot of people that might be on the right wing side of things like they'll tend to kind of go for stuff like um you know banning marijuana right they'll, they'll fight for something like that they have a lot more to fight for but there's not as much really to fight for in on the left really or like for college students like I mean, everything they asked for already came true. I don't really see an ex like I don't I don't really find any real excuse to, you know, hold up a banner and you know scream at people or whatever, or start some revolution against um, the oppressors who give them the ability to vote and give a any kind of voice they want. House the assembly building and force their way in. There's a confrontation with troops who open fire and kill four. Vienna's workers side with the students. Much of the crowd's hostility is directed at Metternich. When the state council suggests he resign, Metternich meekly agrees and heads into exile in England. One of the most extraordinary political careers in Europe's history, spanning 40 years, comes to an end. Emperor Ferdinand suffers from epilepsy and a speech impediment and is a largely passive figure. But when his council announces there will be elections for an assembly that will draft a constitution, crowds cheer him in the street. The secret police disappear. Censorship is ignored. The people of Vienna celebrate. Nationalists within the Austrian Empire are also inspired by events. In the Hungarian parliament, politician Lajos Kossuth makes a fiery speech denouncing Habsburg absolutism as the pestilential air which dulls our nerves and paralyzes our spirit. His speech is printed and circulated widely, inspiring others across the empire. Hungarians launch their own revolution with 12 demands that include greater autonomy, a free press. I would read it, but it's un it's in another language. I think Hungarian, so I, I can't read it. <sighs> Wish I could though. That 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 would be cool, but nah, I can't.
press, and parliamentary reform. Czech liberals in Prague form a national committee and also send their demands to Vienna. There is even a Romanian nationalist uprising in the Ottoman province of Wallachia, forcing the abdication of the local prince. We were dominated by a vague feeling as if a great outbreak of elemental forces had begun. As if an earthquake was coming of which he had felt the first shock. Karl Schwartz, a German student. Oh, yeah, 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 German student. So, like, yeah, that would be a little more left-leaning, I would assume. Also, a lot of Germans were nationalistic, so there probably were a lot of left-leaning nationalists. It kind of died down. Like, the left really hated nationalism after someone like Hitler rose to power with it. But back then, there was a lot of people that were on the left and also enjoyed nationalism. Not really as much as what the right would have liked. But nationalism had like the spectrum. Now it's kind of like mostly on the right. But there were back then a lot more people on the left that did think nationalism was a good idea. Across the smaller states of Germany, rulers face popular demands for reform. Most quickly grant concessions to avoid losing their thrones. The black, red, and gold tricolor, symbol of a united Germany, is prominent among the crowds. Germany's first ever National Assembly meets in Frankfurt. No, I can't. I can't. <laughs> uh, let me get it. You know, I can't say no to something like this. Good for the Kaiser and of the Deutschland. Do say Deutschland, not Do Deutschland. So it's Deutschland. Deutsch with elected delegates Good from across Germany. Which they debate how they will achieve the liberal dream of a unit. Yeah, see, the Frankfurt National Assembly. Nationalism. In a liberal assembly. A lot of liberals were not really like leftists back then. Liberals tended to be just doing more freedom, and then nationalism kind of rode onto the liberal idea until it kind of today is. Very different, but I, I like how it is back then. It was kind of like interesting to look into. Unified Germany and begin drafting its national constitution. In the Prussian capital, Berlin, students and liberals are thrilled by developments and celebrate Metternich's fall. King Frederick William IV promises reform, but also moves extra troops into the city. Tensions escalate between Berliners and soldiers, and on the 18th of March, protesters erect barricades. The army attacks, leading to vicious fighting in the streets. 800 protesters are killed. The king loses his stomach for the slaughter and withdraws troops from the city, promising a new constitution. You're an idiot. <laughs> Why would you try and fight these students that want to create this new idea, a new national identity for the nation? I mean, it's a good idea. They're trying to propose something so great, and I think that's amazing. Uniting the German people. Like, and whoever would not want that from that time is stupid, unless you're like France, and it makes more sense. Sound like your horses, gentlemen, a republic has been declared in France. Nicholas, the Emperor of Russia. Yeah, well, Russia's backwards. Very, very backwards of a nation. Not all Europe is embracing change. Nah. In Russia, Emperor Nicholas firmly opposes any reforms. <laughs> and he has tightened censorship and created a new secret police unit, the Third Department. There is a crackdown on all suspected subversives. Writer Fyodor Dostoevsky is among those arrested and subjected to a mock execution before he is exiled to Siberia. There will be no concessions in Russia. By European standards, Britain is already a liberal constitutional monarchy and the middle classes broadly... Yeah, they're like the most left-leaning European country at the time and probably almost of all time. 
that's kind of how they've always been, very separate from Europe. Accept the status quo. But there is a popular movement calling for more democratic reforms. They're known as the Chartists for the six-point charter they wish to implement. I'm just going to read a little bit. But yeah, um, equal constitutions, he's, you know, parliaments. And then fellow men, the press, uh, having misrepresented and vilified us in our attentions at the demonstration committee, therefore, it considers us to their duty, to state grievances, the working classes, and deep of our demands just. We are our families, and winning is miserable, want and starvation. We demand a fair day's wages for fair day's work. We are the slaves of capital. We demand protection to our labor. So we are political serfs. We demand to be free. It sounds almost like communism, but I do know it was still like not a thing yet. But they did want something like that. But that's kind of the wording someone like Marx did. I think it's almost the same time like Marx wrote his book and stuff. So it is still pretty like it's pretty interesting how it aligns. But I do think at the time it does make sense to make reforms. Definitely not today. Like, we're already pretty good. But back then, it was really, really awful to live in. So I do think reforms without communism, because communism does not help the working class. They actually made it worse. Don't believe me? Look at Soviet Russia. You do not want to work there. A mass rally is organized for the 10th of April in London. This is a photograph of that meeting. The authorities fear violence. Oh, there's so many people. It's crazy. And draft in 80,000 extra police. But the event passes off peacefully. In the Netherlands, King William II backs a new constitution and reforms, successfully preempting any revolutionary disturbance. With fortuitous timing, Frederick VII of Denmark had abolished royal absolutism in January, so also avoids revolution. But he faces a German nationalist revolt in Schleswig-Holstein, which leads to war with the German Confederation. Denmark will ultimately prevail in this war thanks to diplomatic support from the other European powers. In 1848, Polish hopes were high that these revolutions would pave the way for the restoration of an independent Poland. I mean, that's big. Big empire. I know they really wanted to get something like this back again. And you know what? Like, that would be a cool vision for them, but I'm sorry, Poland. You're never going to get that far. Europe's liberals, after all, had frequently expressed enthusiasm for the idea. But in reality, no major power is willing to risk confrontation with Russia for the sake of the Poles. A Polish rising in Posen is put down by the Prussians, while the Austrians... You know what would be a really cool idea for another video, guys? What if I make a new map based off of geography, so we can go to every, like, you know, one year in a 100 years, so one century, we could pick one year, and then we can make a map for it, and then we keep doing that till we get to our century. And then we make our own map and we see how much it updates. And we go by the basis of how many, like the, the majority groups. If it's majority Polish, then they gain the land. If it's majority German, they gain the land. You see what I mean there? And maybe even not in Europe, we can also do a little bit outside. But for now, we'll do Europe and then we can do others. But I think that would be a cool project. Tell me in the comments below if you think that's a good idea because I'm looking forward to that deal with risings in Krakow and Galicia. The February Revolution was like a sacred promise of emancipation for all peoples of Europe. Markle's new, new Paris per, uh, perfect the police. The first euphoric phase of the European revolutions becomes known as the springtime of the peoples. With censorship relaxed, there's an explosion in the number of newspapers, among them Cologne's radical new daily, Neue Rheinische Zeitung, edited by Karl Marx. Karl Marx. Not surprised. It feels like the dawn of a new era. 
But these early successes are built on the back of an uneasy alliance, as Marx is quick to highlight. Middle class liberals want constitutions. Ah, uh, well, so Marx is wrong. Bro, he's proposing really, really stupid ideas. The problem with Marx is he identified the problem correctly, but he didn't create a good solution. He put something so unrealistic. I mean, be honest. How realistic is it that the ideas of everyone can be perfect except if you have a lot of money? What? What if you are always been amazing to people and then you just get a million dollars, right? You're, you found you found a million dollars and you become part of the, you know, the elite rich. But you're still kind to the heart because you were a peasant before. Does that mean you're you're still part of the bourgeoisie and now you're evil and or does that mean since you were a peasant you you were fine like he creates that kind of idea where it's just a an us versus them when really there's spectrums of different people with ideas. It's a really dumb idea how to see the world. I gotta be honest, like, communists, they're so flawed in their ideology. But, you know, that's their opinion. I'll let them have their opinion. And they do have some good ideas, just... I think the most of it's kind of dumb. More inclusion in politics and a free press. Workers, who are the revolutionary foot soldiers in many cities, want cheaper food and the right to work. German radicals sum it up with a neat pun. Freedom to read versus freedom to feed. Europe's new assemblies are under pressure from conservatives who think they're going too far and radicals and socialists who think they're not going far enough. Most horrifying of all to Europe's middle class, there hovers the threat of mass direct action, social revolution, the mob. Better lead, better lead. Rallying cry of Paris workers. <laughs> <In the p> <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't really a good area to highlight. I got, I, he had to work, Wait trying to work like that. France's provisional government had set up national workshops, a public works program to alleviate unemployment in Paris. But just three months later, a new, more conservative government announces their closure. 100,000 workers are suddenly jobless. The response is immediate and furious. 100,000. Remember, the population is still relatively small. Well, seeing up the French population today, I mean, when you compare it back then, it's not that far of a distance. Like, what was the French population back then? It's like maybe 40, 50 million, and in France today, it's like 60 million, so... Then again, not much of a difference. Over three days in June, Paris radicals take on the middle class National Guard and regular troops in a bloody battle of the barricades. The Archbishop of Paris attempts to mediate, but is cut down in a crossfire. This remarkable early photograph shows some of the Paris barricades fought over that summer. By the time it's all over, General Cavagnac's troops have killed at least 1,500 workers and arrest 12,000 more, a third of whom are deported to Algeria. He believes he has saved France from anarchy. The sacred cause of the Republic has triumphed, he declares. The French Revolution has split between left and right, with bloody consequences. I feel like this might be us one day, where it's just the left and the right, the Democrats and Republicans just fight so much that, guess who dies out? It's the innocent. Don't let politics split people. We all have to be together. Remember, there's still some good people who are liberal and on the left, and some good people who are conservative on the right. So I'm going to put this back, because like, I don't want to wear it the whole time. It can be a little uncomfortable. But, hey, I really do enjoy wearing this. <laughs> it paves the way for the return of a famous name from the past, promising unity and order.
Three days of blood will give us 30 years of peace. Joseph Radsky von it is Austrian Field Marshal. I do actually agree with that point. Sometimes you just need some big, you know, not, not too big, just like some aggressive attacks. You know, big fights. And then soon enough, you kind of just take a break for a very long time. And you just chill. You know, it's better than, you know, saving up for this one big thing and then everyone kills each other. And that was like a big problem with like Total War and World War One and World War Two. They were kind of just building up after, you know, so long. They should have, you know, there would have been some other wars happening. They would kind of just get tired and then really not want that and try to avoid it. But World War One was kind of inevitable to happen. That spring, conservative governments had been caught off guard by the speed of events. Now they begin to fight back. In Prague, Czech students clash with troops. The wife of Austrian commander, General Windisch Greitz, is killed by a stray bullet. He responds by withdrawing his troops and bombarding the city's old town with artillery. 43 are killed before the students surrender. So what I'm getting across is that Anywhere where it doesn't have as much college and education, it's going to be kind of like, if it doesn't have it, then it's not really going to have the nationalism or liberalism. But if it does have a lot of that, it's bound to kind of have a lot of nationalist movements and a lot of liberal movements. In Italy, King Carlo Alberto of Piemont, Sardinia, has declared an Italian war of liberation against Austria and invades Lombardy, Venetia. He is supported by the other Italian states and nationalist volunteers, including the Italian Legion, led by professional revolutionary Giuseppe Garibaldi. Austrian forces in Italy are commanded by 81-year-old Field Marshal Radetzky, a distinguished veteran of the Napoleonic Wars. Vienna orders him to negotiate. Instead, Radetzky wages a masterful campaign, fending off the Piedmontese advance, then launching a decisive counterattack. Piedmontese forces retreat in disarray, and Carlo Alberto negotiates a truce. That summer, Johann Strauss composes the Radetzky March to celebrate the old general's victory. It's a good song, I gotta be honest, it hits hard. Some of like, the best songs ever, you know, from 1800, were made by Austrians and German. like, you know, they were German, so they were mostly made by Germans, which is pretty interesting, if I gotta be honest myself. Austrian relations with Hungary are in crisis. The country is now effectively independent, with its own elected parliament and a prime minister, Lajos Batyani. But not everyone wants to be part of the new Hungary. Savage ethnic conflicts break out between Hungarians and Romanians in Transylvania and Hungarians and Serbs in Vojvodina. Makes sense. All that land wasn't really Hungarian, and the Austrians didn't really know what to do with it. But in my opinion, like, you unite your Hungarian people. That land, if it's majority Romanian, give it to Romania. If it's majority Serbian, give it to Serbia. Deal with your own majority people, you know? And then your other groups can just go there. Leaving thousands dead. An even greater threat is Croatian General Josip Jelacic, a fire-breathing imperial loyalist who takes matters into his own hands and invades what he regards as a renegade province. The emperor still hopes for a peaceful resolution and sends a loyal general, Count Lamberg, to take command of Hungarian military forces. But on arrival, he's brutally murdered by a mob. Appalled, the imperial 
government declares war on the Hungarian revolutionaries. This in turn outrages liberals and radicals in Vienna. There is fresh violence on the streets and the Austrian minister of war is lynched. Troops evacuate the city while the emperor flees to Olmutz. Jelicic How bloody was 1848? Marches to the government's aid. He joins forces with Windisch Greats outside Vienna, and together they bombard the city. Then they attack. The October Rising is crushed with the loss of 2,000 lives. 25 revolutionary leaders are executed, including Robert Blum, a member of the German parliament in Frankfurt. He becomes a celebrated martyr of the revolutions. With Vienna secure... Would you rather die as a hero? Or live to see yourself become the villain? ...the Austrian invasion of Hungary can begin. The Hungarians are heavily outnumbered. Budapest falls, and the Hungarian government evacuates to Debrecen. We now have 40,000 men in and around Berlin. Order in Berlin, and we shall have order in the country. Yeah, because Berlin's a very, very major na uh, city. I was going to say nation. <laughs> nah, Berlin was a very major city. And without it, it probably would have really hurt the power of Germany. Well, I guess Prussia, since they own it. Major... Helmuth von Bolt, 21st September 1848. Following the violence in Berlin that March, the King of Prussia withdraws to his palace at Potsdam on the outskirts of the city. Here he is surrounded by loyal troops and conservative advisors, including a 33 year old aristocrat named Otto von Bismarck. Yo, let's go, Otto von Bismarck. He looks a little different. Looks like he's more in his 30s or 40s. Prussian aristocrat. When asked for his view on what should be done, Bismarck says nothing but leans over to a piano and taps out the march of the Prussian infantry. Man. Bro, Otto von Bismarck. <laughs> There's no way to describe him. He is just probably one of the greatest people ever. Like, how, how he kind of was. He's just an amazing guy to learn about in history. And I, I even have, like, some quotes from him. I can tell you another time, but, man, like, he's not only... Not only was he intelligent and a great leader, but he was also funny. He's just a relatable guy. He's so relatable. He He's more comedic, and he's much, much better than, the, like influencers that that's that's the level i'm going with but to be fair influencers are already a very low level and i i don't there's no way to say it i have no way to say it i have no words except he's out of on bismarck <laughs> the forces of conservatism are strong in prussia there is deep loyalty to the state and the king allies like bismarck adopt the enemy's tactics launching conservative political organizations and newspapers to mobilize this support. Berlin for Bonnig und Vaterland. Association for King and Fatherland. King and Fatherland. That's the best part. No, uh, Neo... That's bullshit. <laughs> uh, bullshit. Zuiting, Zuitung, Zuitung. I, I, I got learn German. New Prussian newspaper. <laughs> By November, King Frederick William. Oh, has no maybe it's a Prussia instead of Prussia. It always kind of sounds somewhere, but it just sounds a little more wacky. That's why I noticed in a lot of like stuff in American. So I'll just say something like so Luxembourg. They call it Luxembourg. Yeah, and then with Africa, they call it Africa. You know, a little bit 
whack here, I guess. I, I don't know how to describe that. It's like trying to describe Otto von Bismarck. Noted the infighting of his opponents and the defeat of the Vienna Revolution and decides to act. He orders General Wrangel to lead 13,000 troops into Berlin. They enter the city unopposed and order the Prussian assembly to disperse. It has no option but to comply. Prussia will get its constitution, but it is one handed down by the king under which he retains full executive power. Prussian dreams of a true parliamentary system, even a republic, are dashed. In December, two new players take the stage, who will play key roles in shaping the fate of Europe's revolutions. In Vienna, Emperor Ferdinand abdicates in favor of his 18-year-old nephew, Franz Josef. He will reign until... He looks like he was in the Hearts of Iron 4. Like, I I've seen someone that looks like that in Hearts of Iron 4 when I'm playing. <laughs> Crazy. His death in 1916. In Paris, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, nephew of Emperor Napoleon, is elected president of the French Republic. Bro, like, how are you supposed to compete with someone who's related to Napoleon Bonaparte? <laughs> Makes sense. In a landslide victory. Six million votes. That's crazy. That's crazy. I feel bad for Lamartine. Lamartine. I don't know. Let's feel literal Roman Tavenac. Well, no wonder Bonaparte won. His name's easier to pronounce. He promises to heal divisions, impose order and restore France to her former glory. The moderates feared the victory of the people more than of the Bourbon troops. Francisco Crisp, uh, Crispy Sicilian revolutionary. Bro, all this is happening in like one year. I don't believe it. This is happening like 1850. I, I do... I refuse to believe this is all happening within just like a, just a whole year. That's crazy. All, man, this is one of the most interesting things I've seen in a very long time. You, it's crazy. Just one year, all that stuff is happening. I clearly don't know that much of history now that I really think about it. Like I thought I was a big expert, but it goes even deeper. Like the rabbit hole is insane. I learned something. Thank you, Epic History TV. Thank you. In Italy, the tumult continues into 1849. In the Papal States, the reforms of Pope Pius had seen him held up as an unlikely liberal role model. But escalating radicalism and violence, notably the assassination of his justice minister, Pellegrino Rossi, caused Pope Pius to flee Rome. In his absence, a Roman Republic is declared. It is led by Giuseppe Mazzini, the iconic figurehead of Italian nationalism, who's devoted his life to the unification of his homeland. Great respect. If you're spending your whole life trying to unify your nation, I mean, that that's great respect to you, bro. But elsewhere, the Italian cause fares badly. Carlo Alberto resumes his war with Austria, with disastrous consequences. At the Battle of Novara, Radetzky inflicts another heavy defeat. Carlo Alberto abdicates in favor of his son, Vittorio Emanuele, to avoid a republican revolution. Twelve years later, he'll become the first king of a modern united Italy. In the south, Ferdinand reverts to absolutist rule and sends troops to Sicily to stamp out the revolution. Then, to the dismay of liberals across Europe, French President Louis Napoleon sends troops to crush the Republic of Rome and put the Pope back on his throne. He has decided the support of French Catholics is more important to him than the fate of Italian Republicans. You know what? I guess 
I would support my people more than some other four nation. And it's not like they're going to become so strong that they'll overthrow me. So I, I think this decision actually isn't that bad. French forces are led by General Udino, son of the famous Marshal. Rome's defenders are led by Garibaldi. But despite skilled and courageous resistance, Rome is forced to surrender after a two-month siege. That summer, Radetzky also retakes Venice and puts an end to its The siege Republic. of Venice ends. In March, the German National Oh, it's 1849 now. ...had finally agreed on a constitution for a united Germany. It is to be a constitutional monarchy under an emperor. The man intended to play this role is Frederick William of Prussia. Wait, so when he so like, declines the offer, oh, this the is the is killed stone. I'm trying to remember the name, the German Confederation, I believe. Yeah, I talked about this in one of my videos. So they're starting the German Confederation now, and it's like this whole group of all the German states uniting together as a team, and they're ex except we don't like Prussia, and then Prussia just says, you know, screw you guys, and then does their own thing and becomes the German Empire. I wonder what would happen in history if the Austrians united Germany, or if, like, Prussia didn't do all that and they, like, kind of lost. That would be very interesting to look at in the world. Dead. In public, he says it is impossible without the consent of the other German princes. In private, he says he would never accept a crown from the gutter, disgraced by the stink of revolution. Revolts in support of the national constitution break out in Saxony, the Palatinate, and the Grand Duchy of Baden. They are crushed by local forces assisted by Prussian troops. The Frankfurt Parliament itself is dissolved. What hope there had been for a united Germany under a liberal What hope there had been for a united Germany under a liberal constitution lies in ruins. In Austria, the new emperor, Franz Josef, issues his own new constitution, reclaiming almost all political power. He also revokes all the liberal reforms passed by the Hungarian parliament, known as the April Laws. In response, Lajos Kossuth declares formal Hungarian independence, and the country begins an extraordinary campaign of military mobilization. All right, so now we're getting to a, the second year. All right. Hungarian commander, General Gergely, retakes Budapest. He then launches a bloody assault on Buda Castle, overpowering its Austrian garrison. In desperation, the Austrian emperor travels to Warsaw to formally request military aid from the emperor. Bro, bro, bro. Constantly needing help. Of Russia. Russian troops have already moved into Moldavia and then Wallachia to put down the Romanian liberal revolution. Nicholas. Makes sense because they want to take the Balkans. And if Hungary becomes a problem. And, you know, that probably wouldn't, wouldn't really benefit them. They would probably want Austria still united because. Hungary could be a big opposition. On the other hand, if Hungary is free, they can probably be able to take uh, these areas much, much more, you know, easily. But I still think they would have to deal with Hungary. And, well, there's not really much of the Slavic lands there. There's more Slavic areas around these two areas, I believe. And then mostly more down, like, this whole area. And since they're Slavic, that's what they would want. So, hmm. I'm not sure what Russia's plan was. I guess an excuse to take over Romania. So my guess. agrees to send troops to Hungary to crush those he describes as the enemies of order and tranquility. Hungary faces an impossible strategic situation. Surrounded and... Bro, you don't win this. <laughs> Does that make sen sense? Maybe because like... They just want more of the, the polit 
like politics of these countries on their, his side, right? The uh, emperor, the Tsar of Russia, he most likely would want them to be on his side of the political aisle. And outnumbered more than two to one. The combined onslaught is irresistible. The Hungarian forces are driven south and finally forced to surrender. In the aftermath, around 120 Hungarian politicians and army officers are executed. So ends Hungary's War of Independence. We have been beaten and humiliated. The fate of European democracy has slipped from our hands. Pierre Joseph Proudhon, French socialist. Nah, nah, bro. 1848 was a year like no other. A series of seismic political events following one upon another like falling dominoes. But what had been achieved? A British historian famously described 1848 as the turning point at which modern history failed to turn. And for all the euphoria of Europe's springtime of the peoples, by 1849, it seemed that the counter-revolutionaries had won everywhere. But some gains did endure. So, what I'm trying to get at is this is the attempt at making the modern world, but it failed. Yeah, because like every attempt didn't work out well. So this is kind of like the what really created the modern world was right after World War One and World War Two. Eighteen forty eight was just the attempt of that. It could have gone even farther back, but it didn't. So yeah, I just don't think the modern world was was um you know ready you know i don't i don't think it, the 1840s is ready for our world or like what would happen today but imagine if they did like that would be very interesting but mm, it failed you know yeah ha what happened happened and the next time they do this would happen around the you know the german empire would reunite and then italy would reunite so this happens more like the 1860s and that's i think when the the turning point comes again because right after that the hungarians get austria-hungary so they have to wait like 20 to 30 years such as the abolition of serfdom in austria and the popular vote in france though france became a little less democratic in 1852 yeah. <laughs> after louis he makes another empire <laughs> which fails because you know prussia just comes in napoleon made himself emperor across europe Governments modernized and paid more attention to economic and social issues, partly in response to the new challenges that had emerged from socialist Boo. class politics. Communist manifesto is stupid. I'm reading it right now. It's kind of confusing. and It, it just all talks about bourgeoisie, um, you know, oppressing, you know, poor class or whatever. And it says it's been like this. The bourgeoisie have been in this plot since the medieval era or something like that. It, it just feels more like a conspiracy theory by some crazy guy. Also, Karl Marx is like, he didn't even work. Like, he wasn't a hard worker. He let his family die and starve and all that. And he cheated on his wife. He was not, you know, um, a faithful husband. So, like, I don't know why I should trust someone who was so immoral. It was also quite racist for the time, too. So, I, I don't trust this guy. The causes of German and Italian unification had been defeated, but made giant strides and learned crucial lessons. Their goals would not be achieved by ideas alone, but the realities of force. Yeah. That's something I think many and many of the liberals had to learn. You can't really just do it by coming up with it and then showing it everyone you kind of have to be tough and show it force but that's what a lot of liberals can't do now this is more in the modern day they're not willing to really um use force as much like they'll do it that sometimes and now the left sometimes will go by force they'll kind of just shame you but you can really do resist it it's not like 
if you say one thing, they'll get you fired from a job. It's not like 100% going to guarantee that every time. What we need to do is be tougher against stuff like that. For the liberals at the time, yeah, they didn't really um, fight back much. They kind of just had it, and then they got clapped. Like, they just collapsed. But I do think that it, it most likely, I don't think it would have gone well anyway. Even if it did work out really well in the 1848, it still would have all failed. And like, in my opinion, I just don't think it was ready. But the perfect time he came in with Audubon Bismarck and the Italian reunification around more in the 1860s, you know, that type of stuff. In the words of Bismarck, the great questions of the day were to be settled not through speeches and majority decisions, but by iron and, and blood. Bro, Audubon Bismarck, he is a true goat. It'll sometimes be hidden from people who just like, Oh yeah, this happened. And then uh, next up, we have the World War One and then World War Two. A lot of people just see the top of the iceberg, which is just like World War Two, and then right below it, World War One, and then right below it, 1848. It would be wars waged by powerful monarchies that united Germany and Italy. The legacy of 1848 for good and ill, would be felt for decades to come. True. Napoleon and Care. Really, really beautiful maps. And it just looks cool. Anyways, that's it um, for the video. Thank you so much for watching. I'm pretty proud of what happened. Or not proud. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying anymore. I'm tired. Um, I'm just happy about the video. I think Epic History TV, they're going to make great content. I give them um, this video like in maybe an 8.7 out of 10. Like this video is awesome. I got to be honest. Very well made. And hope they continue on this uh, quest for making great content. And I'll see you soon. Let's give it a like. Goodbye.